Mark, the whole point of my talk show is to show you that even with having a learning disability, I can still amount to something. And at the same time, I'm able to turn myself into an example for people out there dealing with any types of learning disabilities and disabilities and never give up and prove people wrong. Prove to them that labels do not dictate who you are and who you're going to be to prove them to stem out to something. My name is Keith Andrew and welcome to the Keith Andrew Network. Today it is episode 969. That is right, we are here 969. We are this close to 1000. Today we sit down with upcoming professional actor and best selling. Actually, you know, I'm really best selling. I can do that again. Today on the Keith Angie Network, we sit down with an upcoming professional actress who is also known as a book novelist. You will see and hear all the great stories from her acting career and her writing career. But before we take a commercial break, if you're watching on YouTube, please like and subscribe, leave a comment. This will be also be airing on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, and all social media. So remember, follow the hashtag KeithAnzi Network, like, share, comment, and subscribe. Hi, I'm Heidi Von Kolesk, and I've just been interviewed by Keith Andrew, and we've talked about acting and writing and books and movies and life, and we have had so much fun, and if you watch this, I think you're going to have fun too. It's a great interview, and he's a great host, so Keith, keep up the good work. And uh, I had a ball. Thanks. If you're watching on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and all social medias, please leave a comment. I would love to interact with you. Our guests would love to interact with you. And we can only grow bigger together. Now, today, our guest is an upcoming professional actress. And you are also a bug anomalous. So, the first question I want to ask, and I keep posting it in that word, you got to inside novel is and then when yeah. I say okay say it novelist <laughs> <laughs> okay it's just whatever but it's it, a it's, mouthful <laughs> it is yeah. so the first question I want to I want to ask you is tell our audience a little bit about yourself and a little about your background okay so I've always liked words and I've always considered myself a, a storyteller so I am a storyteller whether I'm an actor and I'm telling someone else's story or I'm a writer and I'm telling my own stories. And I think the big difference is that when you're an actor, then you're just breathing life into the roles or into the words. They're not your words, but you're making them come alive. And when you're a writer, they're your words and you're creating you know, the whole picture. And um, um, writing's a very solitary activity. It's a very introverted activity, and I like that. And acting is very extroverted activity, and I like that too. So I get to move between two worlds, but both of the worlds are the worlds of storytelling. And I think story, I think story is very important, you know. And I always, even if it's fiction, I try to find the truth in the story. So, so that's what I'm about. I'm about, I'm about stories and storytelling. Yeah, it's really interesting you should say that. Because he just reminded me of something. I did an interview yesterday. It was a double interview. He was a TV producer. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, let's do the episode again. But let's do the do's and don'ts. And I think you would be a perfect example of doing that very first. I, I usually just say, let's ask the next question. But you know what? Let's make it a little more interactive and hard-headed so if, if i may okay i'm scared oh, now i'm scared <laughs> and you, this is perfect for me too and anyone with disabilities and we get to that so let's do the do's and don'ts mm -hmm. but with that being said you know i know i have a family member who is a book writer now yeah. the do's and don'ts do you recommend doing a outline before doing the story, or should you do the story before the outline? What are the do's and don'ts? Well, now, the proper way is to do an outline first so you know what you're doing. And um, But I, I tend to work backwards a lot. And sometimes I kind of start with an image 
and I end with an image and I fill it in. So something that will hit me emotionally or visually will, uh, will be the thing that will start it off. And uh, so what I tend to do is somewhere in between. I'll write the first few pages and take a look at what I have. And then from there, decide where I'm going with an outline. Um, so I never do an outline before that first image comes to me. And maybe that's because I come from a film background that I work in images a lot. But so I'll have a very strong first image. And then from that, I'll, I'll write maybe five, six pages. And then I'll take a look at it and I'll wonder what I have. And from there, go into an outline situation. No, oh, perfect. Next question I want to ask is, what makes you different from a competition? You mentioned that you are also an actor, actress, yeah. and you're also a writer. So you get to see things from two different points of view. Does mm -hmm. that make you different from the competition? As a writer, I think it might. I think that um, one of the things I have is a really good sense of dialogue and a sense of different voices. I think one of the traps that a writer can fall into when you have a lot of different characters is um, making everyone sound the same. So I think that my time in front of the camera or on the stage has allowed me to pick up on how different characters will talk, you know, based on where they're from, based on their experience, based on who they're talking to. So um, I think that that helps me, in, in, you know, in, in terms of dialogue and rhythm and sound. And I think the other thing that gives me a leg up is that, as I said before, the visual thing. So when I'm writing a book, for instance, I like to be able to put the reader into a place where they can, they can see it. They feel like they're there. Um, you know, I also, I also write, um, screenplays. So that's, that's like falling in between the two worlds, right? That's like doing them both. But, uh, my, but my love is novel writing. And, um, and I, I, uh, I, I think that, I don't think that acting is taken away from writing. I think it's actually enhanced it in, in many ways. I really do. But I, I don't think I write like an actor. I think I write like a director, right? Where I see the whole picture and uh, I get into the heads of many characters uh, as opposed to it being like a, a singular story in the first person, you know, and so so I, I tend to be much more um, a singular um, artist when I'm, when I'm acting the film and I'm much more expansive when I write a book. So that's nice for me, you know. No, absolutely. Now, what do you feel that you benefit from? Like, what are your strengths? Like, you know, you wrote a lot of great books. Now, do you enjoy writing books or do you actually want to think outside the box and write an audio book? Oh, well, you know, I recorded my one of my books as an audio book. And um, that was great fun. <laughs> I loved it. Uh, you know, I, I uh, well, well, you know, because really what you're doing is not that far away from, you know, recording because you are recording. You, you know, you are recording visually, but you're also recording, you know, a, a soundscape in a sense in your interviews. And an, an audio book is that you're creating, you're using your voice as well as what's written on the page but you're not using the visual. So again, you are creating a visual for the listener in the same way you would as a writer. You, you are using your voice and using the words to paint a picture in that person's head. And so I love that because, you know, you just make it a little bit quieter. You make it a little bigger. You do an accent. You, it, 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 it was a real, it was a real challenge. And, uh, and it was very, it was, it was a lot of fun. It was really exciting. And uh, I hope to record other people's audiobooks. I may be recording a friend of mine's with him. Um, the book's called Kin Mount. And uh, so I'll read all the female characters and he'll read the narrator and the male characters. So I get a chance to do another audiobook. But um, I can't imagine writing for an audiobook. I can only imagine writing it as a book and then, it, you know, so. I guess I'm a traditionalist. It's like, okay, one step, then the other step. I, I think, you know, going straight to audiobook would be, you know, that'd be like jumping over some steps. And uh, um, I don't know if I'm ready for that yet. <laughs> Maybe later. Well, I was going to ask you a question, but I think you just answered it. But I'm going to ask you anyway. You know, have you ever ghostwritten, ghostwritten for someone? And would you be interested in writing my book about me? 
Oh, well, maybe. Um, I have rewritten people's books and uh, helped them publish it so that I've taken, you know, their basic book and, or their basic outline and turned it into a book. And I've done that with, um, with scripts as well. Um, so, uh, yes, that's definitely something we can talk about. Yeah, ghostwriting. Yeah. No, absolutely. I make a very good ghost. Look at me. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, for me, I'm very pale in the summer, so I try to stay in the sunlight. Me too. Me too. Do you burn? Do you get a I do. Burn? Me too, right? I was always the kid swimming in the t shirt because, you know, I'd have the burnt shoulders. I'd spend my summers pulling the skin off that was burnt. You know, it was yeah, just terrible. I give you an example. I'm a part-time dog trainer, and I, and even before that, I worked at uh, in Woodbury Commons over at the bubble stand where we yeah. used to print myself bubbles, and I would turn red, and I'd be so excited. Hey, look, look, I got a tan, I got a tan, and they're like, <laughs> what are you, stupid? You got a second-degree burn. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. Well, I was once. I went to Barbados with my mom and my aunt, they're identical twins, and I was there for a week, and I had the best tan of my life. And someone came up to me and said to me, oh, did you just get here? Because me tanned was anyone else absolutely pale beforehand, right? I thought, I got some color on me. I've got some, you know, I, I tanned. But, and I was very careful the whole time. But, yeah, but people thought that I had just gotten there because, you know, so, oh, well. <laughs> It is a burden we have to carry. <laughs> it's true. So the next one I want to ask you, a little theme about the show, have you ever worked as people with disabilities? And for people with learning disabilities who want to follow in your footsteps, what are your words of wisdom? Okay, so that's a double question. So let's start with the first half. Yes, I have. And uh, I have to say that I think that the film industry has gotten much better. And uh, I, I, I don't know in the States, but I know in Canada, it has become uh, a very, it's, been, it's a very important directive that the film industry is more inclusive in, in many ways. And I have served on some committees to ensure that that happens. That two things, that's, that sets are safe for everyone and that sets are more inclusive. And uh, so, so that has become um, a top priority here. And of course, we still have miles to go. I, I think that we are much, much, much better than we were. But I think it's something that we all have to be aware of and that we have to work towards. And so so the uh, our union is called ACTRA here. So we all have to be on board and we all have to, you know, and we all have to, to make sure that that happens. And yes, I have worked with people with disabilities and... Uh, and I have found that the sets have been very, um, very caring and inclusive and uh, the work was good right across the board. So, you know, so that's great. And, um, and so my advice is, my, my advice is that if anyone doesn't treat you well on a set to make sure you find an actor representative because something will be done about it for starters. Uh, my next advice is if you're writing, for instance, I would give the same advice to, to anyone with disabilities or not. And that is you have to put in the time. You know, they, there's this old saying that there's 10,000 hours to get really great at anything. So it's about putting in the time and not getting discouraged. And of course, if you have greater challenges, then not being discouraged is also a greater challenge. Um, but, um, I just, you know, I just think that you, you have to believe in yourself. You have to keep going no matter what. And, uh, and that's, and that's, that's both, both for acting and for, um, you know, and, and, for, and for writing. You know, I have a collective of actors that get together and we read scripts for fun. We read scripts that I write for fun. And, um, and, and it's, it's a, it's very much a celebratory. Uh, endeavor and uh, it's very very inclusive I have to tell you and I'm just amazed at uh, at the at the talent that we're able to bring together you know so. no, absolutely it's, it's all about having the heart and passion for it passion is a big key right and if you don't have the passion then it's easier to to stop but the passion is the thing that will keep you going through the hard times and the disappointments and you know and, and you know the arts are not easy the arts the arts are, are hard and uh, and they're not um, 
they're not a typical field to go into. And so, and so, you know, it's, it's, what's difficult is to be a great artist. You have to have a certain vulnerability about you, right? You have to have a big heart. You have to be able to feel things and, and understand what you're feeling or not be afraid to go through the feelings. And then the rejection that an artist gets is awful, right? And sometimes the treatment that you get is horrible. So you also have to have a tough skin. So you're going between being like, you know, like, take it on the chin. Yes, you're rejected. And having an open heart to do good art. And, and that's a difficult balance, right? It's a difficult balance for, for everyone. But uh, I would think that people with disabilities, I think it would be an even harder balance in some ways because there would be a question of why am I being rejected? Is it my work? Is it me? And uh, I mean, in, and in film, um, you know, we all ask that question, right? Because it's a very subjective industry. But, um, but I think that the only thing that will keep you going is what you said, passion. Absolutely. I'm sorry. I was just distracted by the plugs. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> why, is it, why does it go three, four, five, four, six? And like, oh, yeah. Well, I it's just thought I put like the big number in the middle and then go out because some of the books, like I, I didn't realize when I bought the collection that there were some duplicates there. So, they look nice, but I think I'll have to I'll have to give the duplicates away to someone who who would like a lovely leather bound book. So, so um, yeah, so there's probably not a really good reason for the order. <laughs> Let me tell you. I mean, books are great. They they keep um, you read them. They keep your mind busy. Also, if you have a big ass spider in a room, you have something very handy to use. In fact, it's a weapon, and it's <laughs> it's entertainment. <laughs> it's, I have um, books under my computer right now to prop it up, so I have good angles. So it's you know it's a, it's a computer lifter upper. <laughs> <laughs> Multiple uses. So Multiple you have to uses. Love it. Exactly. Buy books, folks. Multiple uses. <laughs> <laughs> so the next one I want to ask you is: What is difficult for you about being an actor and a writer? Uh, well, one of the things is difficult is um i'll tell you when my when my book came out I, I i got some pretty nice reviews and um some people said in the literary world they said the only reason i got good reviews on my book was because i was an actor so uh, there is a bit of a prejudice um there's a prejudice against actors there's a lot of people who do not think that actors can be smart um and so you know, I sort of had to, um, you know, I wouldn't say fight my way around that, but I had to tolerate the, um, you know, uh, people thinking that, A, that I was writing books because I wasn't getting the roles that I wanted anymore, or I was too old, or I wasn't beautiful enough anymore, and B, because, uh, you know, actors are not smart enough to write books, or particularly uh, female actors, because I, I do find that there's a difference in how female actors are treated to male. Um, so the big, the big thing for me was the perception. Oh, she's an actor who thought she could write a book because I acted first. Um, and so I think that was the, uh, I think that's a, I think that's one of the biggest things, you know, and, uh, because I actually, I think that the two industries, I think that acting and writing go really well together. I have quite a few, um, actor friends who have put out books in the last little while and, uh, and I've, and I've loved all of them. Um, so there seems to be a bit of a trend of actors writing. And the next two questions I find very interesting. And actually, you know, it's funny. I've been interviewing actors, so I have, like, acting questions. I'm like, huh, I should ask this for another person. So I have, like, writing questions. I have, like, <laughs> producing questions. But anyway, uh, the question I want to ask you is, as a writer, what are your values? Ah, well, I, I think that anything that I write has to have a moral backbone of some kind. And I think that it's important for me to create a world that is not only a plot-driven world, not only a character-driven world, but it to be an experiential world. So one of my values is that when I take the writer by the hand, the reader by the hand, that they can, that they feel that they're in a safe place and they can trust me. And, you know, I'm not going to pull fast one on them. And um, and then it's important for me to give them an experience in the reading, not just, you know, a brain tickle. So that's really important. And then, you know, then then um, 
then I have a sense of, you know, um, you know, shining the light on something. And uh, I'll give you an example with my last book. Um, um, it bothered me that the film industry, uh, in, in a 40 year span did like almost 70 films in which there were people with albinism. And in all of those films, in all of those 68 films, I, I think there were, in all of those films, the people with albinism were always uh, portrayed as evil or soulless or insane. They were always, they were never a hero. They were never true flesh and blood. They were, they, you know, and I, and I just think that that is irresponsible of Hollywood. And so one of the things I wanted to do in this book was to create, you know, these twins who had the same passions as any other girls who had the challenges, you know, because of how they were perceived. Um, and that they had to, they had to rise up beyond the perceptions in order to, in order to create a life that they wanted to live, you know, in order to succeed, in, or, in order to triumph. And, uh, and that they were good, right? And they, uh, you know, and, and they were real and they were human because Hollywood has portrayed people of albinism as, as non-human. And, you know, and there's a genocide against people with albinism in some countries, right? So, um, so, so that was one small thing I wanted to explore. And I wanted to make sure that I did it in a way that was responsible. So I, I try to make everything I write responsible and for, for it to be, um, based in a, uh, in a sense of reality. So research to me is really, it's actually my favorite part of writing. I love research. And so um, research is very, very important to me as well. I don't want to get things wrong if I can get it right. So. Now the next one is kind of similar to values is what is the most rewarding part of being an actor, um, writer, sorry. Well, I think the most um, rewarding part of both is that selfishly I get to live a creative life you know I don't have to go into the same place every single day and I don't have to you know well as an actor you do answer to someone you answer to the director and as a writer you do answer to your publisher at some point but um but while you're creating you know you you are in a creative space and I think that I think for me that that is work that is really truly connected to the soul you know so i I, so i'm i'm very privileged that i get to work in the arts i am you know very lucky that i get to do soul work and um and you know and, and to as an actor you experience many lives you know and so i i get to experience many lives either through the characters i play or through the characters i write and i hope I, I really hope that makes me a little bit more empathetic in my daily life. I really do. You know, I really hope that by being able to wear other shoes or other hats or whatever you want to call it, uh, allows me to see the world through eyes that are different than my own eyes from time to time. No, you're absolutely right. Now, the other one I want to ask you is, have you, well, let me rephrase this one. Have you proceeded your career as you wanted to? Well, you know, I, no, <laughs> yeah. you know, I, I would have liked to have been way more successful, um, you know, but I think anyone, anyone would say that, but then you think, well, how do you measure success? And it's interesting because I was just talking to a musician the other day and, uh, and, and he's a very, um, very established, you know, musician with like platinum records and, and it's had a whole life and he didn't feel like he had done enough. And I think that that happens with a lot of artists. We don't feel like we've done enough somehow, right? Or that time is running out. And, uh, and so the, what I said to him is something I need to heed myself. You know, it's very easy to give advice to other people, but you, you know, it's hard to give it to yourself. And I said, you've lived a life in the arts and that's, that's hard, but it's also amazing. And anyone who has stayed in the arts as long as you have or as long as I have, is a success. And I have to remember that sometimes that, you know, I, I have been lucky to live a life in the arts and that's what I do. And how fantastic is that? And that in itself is a success. Yeah. Yeah. There are other roles I would have liked to have played, 
you know, and, uh, oh yeah, there are awards I would have liked to have won. And, you know, I would have liked if my book had sold many more copies than it did, you know, and that my first book did better, all of that. But, you know, but that's like looking at the minus side. When you look at the plus side, you have to go, I've, I've been able to, to, to write books and to communicate with people I don't know. And, uh, and, and live a creative life and maybe that maybe that is success right there and you know maybe we all need to be a little bit more appreciative of that you know I certainly need to count my blessings more instead of have regrets you know I agree so 100% oh, I'm, no, I'm, gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna pass it over to you but the last two questions I want to ask you is tell our audience a little bit about your book and before you do I, how I always end the show, I want you to be brutally honest. When I first approached you to be a guest on my talk show, what made you say yes? How do you feel now? And what do you recommend to other people? You can say whatever you like. Which question do you want me to do first? Oh, let's start to talk about your book. Okay, so um, so my last book is called Two White Queens and the One I Jack. Um, I have it here. Okay. Ta -da. And, um, it's put out by Dundurn Press. It inspired me in a very strange way. I was just going to my cafe, and what flashed into my head was the image of a boy falling from a tree and losing his eye. And you have two characters with, you know, monocular vision in this book, and yet it doesn't it doesn't stop them from from living their lives. And what happens when Jack loses his eye is that there's a series of events that that follow him, that changes the lives of everyone around him. And so you question whether or not, you know, this horrible accident was, was fate or whether or not it just happened to change everyone's lives. And through it, we find um, love and we find triumph, we find loss, we find sacrifice for, for love. And um, so when Jack and his best friend Gareth meet the twins who have albinism, um, you know, their fates become intertwined. And what we have then is the journey of the individuals combined with how we are all interconnected. So what happens to one of us happens, happens to all of us in a sense, in a bigger or a lesser way. And it takes place from uh, uh, a decade after the war until November 9th, 1989. And um, so November 9th isn't only my birthday. But there's a few big historic things that happen on November 9th. And uh, certainly it, it happens in this, you know, this book. And the other thing I'm just going to say is in terms of, um, you know, why I wrote it. I, I started to write it at a time when there's a lot of talk about putting up walls. And I wanted to write a book that was about tearing the walls down and about, you know, um, being more inclusive and being more global and, uh, you know, so I, I wanted to write a book that was set in a time when we actually had some hope. And it was about, you know, the tearing down and uh, getting together as opposed to uh, separating. So that's, you know, that's the, those are the themes about my book. And, um, and um, but it's, it's, it's actually a lot, it's actually a lot of fun. I'm making it sound very serious. Um, so, so yeah, now I, uh, I, uh, I wanted to be on your show. I want because I remember I said to you, you should read my book because we talked about about people who have who have struggles and they triumph, and 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 we talked about that before we talked about doing your show. And I said you should read my book because of the struggles that the albino twins have, because of Jack losing his eye and what he's capable of doing, what he ends up doing, and um, so that's how you and I started to talk. And and I found you have the show. And, uh, you know, and I get asked to do shows, you know, often-ish. Um, but then I watched one of your shows, and, um, and I was taken with, uh, with your professionalism and the fun of it. I don't think I've been as much fun as the show I watched, but there you go. Um, and, uh, and that's what I wanted to be on your show. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. Now I do have a couple questions for you off the air. But wrapping up... For our viewers, make sure to leave a comment. I don't know if you can hear my dog barking in the background. Mm -hmm. I do apologize. Yeah. <laughs> my dog's been quiet. It's amazing, actually. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah, I do have a couple questions for you off the air. But if anyone's watching on LinkedIn, Twitter, YouTube, and Facebook, definitely leave a comment. Our, if you would love to see a part two of us talking, definitely help us reach our goal of 100. We will definitely do a part two. I would like to invite you to be part of my Christmas episode and a part of my 10 year anniversary. You can definitely talk about that off the air. But wrapping up, it was a real honor and privilege to have me as a guest, and I'm looking forward to part two. As we meet again down the road, I appreciate the honor, and catch you later. Thank you, and have a good night.